This program is brought to you by Emory University. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today our visiting uh, scholars in practice, Dr. Patrice Harris and Jennifer Bartel, uh, who will be presenting today on brain development, stress, and trauma. Those of you, all of you, who work in the child welfare community um, are probably picking up on hearing this term about trauma-informed approach or trauma-informed care. And so we want to bring some speakers to talk really about what that means um, from their disciplinary perspective. Dr. Harris is the Director of Health Services with the Fulton County Department of Health and Human Services, and Jennifer Bartle is the Program Manager for Child, Adolescent, and Family Programs, the Fulton County Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Their full biographical information is included in the materials that have been provided to you, so I do commend you to take a look at those. Both of these folks are um, just deeply, deeply experienced and talented and knowledgeable, and so please take a look at their qualifications and you'll know why we have them in front of our room. Um, and with that, please join me in welcoming to the presentation our visiting scholars in practice, Dr. Patrice Harris and Jennifer Bartle. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for um, not extending your holiday weekend. That's therefore you're here today to come to this talk. Um, it certainly is a pleasure uh, for me uh, to be here today. And if, if you see me move away and move back quickly, it's because I am a wanderer. I don't like to stand behind a mic, and so, but I do know that for the purpose of the video. So he's going to give me a high sign every time I, I uh, uh, stray too far away from the microphone. But it is a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, Melissa was just telling someone that I am sort of the original uh, Barton Child Law and Policy Fellow, um, and I'm not sure the current funding, but I was funded by the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation. Um, and so it's, it's so exciting for me to be there. I am a child psychiatrist by training, medical school in West Virginia, read my bio, but I trained here at Emory. But always I've been interested in policy, sort of integrating the policy and the practice. Never uh, was I interested in just being in my own private practice office, just seeing uh, my patients, which I love and which I do, although with my current responsibilities in Fulton County, not as much as I used to. But I felt like in order to make a broader impact, I wanted to um, make sure that what I was doing was informing practice and policy for all children and that I kept up to date with policies and practices to inform my work um, as a physician, uh, certainly, um, and I think this is true. And this is, medicine, healthcare is evolving, and no longer are physicians um, in their offices uh, just saying, I'm just going to see my patient right here, and I, and I don't want to know if they don't have a place to live, and I don't want to know, um, if someone in the family is unemployed, because informed doctors, informed communities know that there is um, a term called the social determinants of health. We'll chat a little bit about that at the end, and that uh, there are all sorts of things that affect health care. And if, if physicians um, take a look at the time that we spend in front of folks, Let's say somebody comes to us four times a year. That's maybe an hour, depending on what's going on, a couple of hours. And so we really need to look broader and look at what's going on in communities and in uh, folks' homes. So we're going to talk a little bit about brain development, stress, and trauma, trauma-informed care. And what I want you to leave with today are some, some answers. Not all the answers, not a magic bullet, but some answers or a direction of, that we should all be thinking about um, as we work with children, particularly those who um, have been maltreated or are uh, exposed to significant amounts of stress. I usually begin a lot of my talks with enough about the problems, let's talk about the solutions, but we are going to talk about the problem a little bit today just to give you a little bit of background, but we do want to leave you with some solutions and certainly hope to have dialogue at the end as we come up with solutions together for this uh, particular community. So, you know, I, I wish 
we could come up with another term for silos because it's almost, you know, everybody says it all the time now, all of us are in our silos, but this is a critical issue and it's still true. We're working on it, hopefully um, in your areas of work, you're working on it. But, you know, we've got a lot of knowledge out there, um, but each of us sort of has knowledge within our own silo. The health community has knowledge within our own silo and how we work education, economic development, human services, a lot of knowledge, but um, not a cohesive, uh, coordinated, integrated knowledge. And so each of us is, ex is informed by science and experience that relates to our particular area. But as I said earlier, that is no longer going to work. As a matter of fact, it's not working. It's not working. And we do have to look at a new approach and we have to connect all of these things because they are interconnected if we really want to impact what's going on with children. And, you know, and, and it's very important, you know, the cliche, children are our future, but really from an economic standpoint, from a health standpoint, we really have to address what is going on with children in order to assure a stable future for all of us. Um, I see a wide range of ages in this room, but we need folks who are working productive, healthy citizens if you and I in this room want to retire. <laughs> That's the way it works in this country, right? So I do want to retire. So we need to make um, an extra effort to make sure that we are working to make sure our children are stable, healthy, uh, productive uh, citizens. So here's what we need to get to. We need to bring all of our science and all of our expertise and all of our experience together to come up with the science of early childhood. And let me just say, I am not a neuroscientist. As you said, as I said earlier, I'm a child psychiatrist. Uh, General Jennifer is a licensed marriage and family therapist, but I, I'm a synthesizer of the data. And so what I'm bringing you today is sort of a synthesis of some of the data and some of the thinking um, that's out there based on the evidence though, not just a grand idea I came up with last night. You'll see on the bottom of these slides uh, are from a presentation that how many of you either went to or looked on the web when the Arthur Blank Family Foundation had a presentation on building better brains? Did any of you see that? Very good, because <laughs> I'm using, it's Dr. Jack Schoenkopf of Harvard um, doing a lot of good work on this. But I was teasing Melissa, you know, I've been, I was doing this work when I was at Barton, and when, when was that, 98, 99? And I have to tell you, when they first asked me to do the work, I did the research and looked at the science, and I was a little nervous, because I am a physician, and, uh, you know, and I believe in alternative medicine and some of the other things, but I like to have data, you know, because people die when doctors don't use practices based on data. So I was, I saw the data that was out there and it was emerging at that point, let me just say that. And it was making me a little nervous, but I said, well, let's just learn from it. Let's say what it is. The science is early and new, uh, but let's, um, it, it, it seems promising and it seems to have a lot of promise in how we work with children. So um, the science has expanded exponentially since then, and so I'm going to be bringing to you uh, work from Harvard and some other groups, uh, but I'm really excited about what's going on um, at Harvard. And so I'm gonna use some of Dr. Schoenkopf's uh, slides and videos at Harvard, show you their website. They are doing a lot of good work, and that's good because Harvard, you know, has the uh, gravitas, and uh, they obviously have the funding. So, so that's okay. So, um, you know, Emory has the gravitas, and Emory has the funding, and so that's okay. That's the way it works kind of in, in academics. So I'm, I'm happy uh, to say that. But I did have to say I was doing this presentation. You know, I always say I'm a, from West Virginia, so how, how many of you heard the Barbara uh, Mandros, I was country when country wasn't cool? <laughs> So, you know, I was talking about child maltreatment or brain development when it wasn't cool, so. So here we are, and again, we have to put the pieces of the puzzle together, together to come up with the, the science of early childhood. So let's just talk about some core concepts of childhood development, and again, in addition to Harvard, I'll give you the website. Um, here's another resource for you, the developingchild.net. 
actually that um, was, I think, an early precursor. Harvard now has changed. And so there's been a lot of work done. You know, the Institute of Medicine has looked at this. The MacArthur Research Network has looked at this. And then, of course, Harvard. And here is the, um, the website. And I really love this website, so I really encourage you to go. It's www.developingchild.harvard.edu. EDU, and that's Dr. Jack Schoenkoff, and um, I really was excited because the first part of his presentation was similar to mine. He had fancier videos that I'm going to show you, but actually what I hadn't thought about it, actually what was a light bulb to me, and, I, and I'll show you um, what he uh, talked about, which was a light bulb to me, and then I want you to let me know if it's a light bulb to you, but he's talking about, okay, what are we going to do going forward? And he freely admitted that at this point they have, an, they have a hypothesis at this point. But it makes sense to me. And so I want to see if it makes sense to you. OK, so the 1990s was the decade of the brain. Anybody have a guess as to why it was the 1990s versus the 1950s or 60s? I didn't hear you. Drug use? Not quite. What, what stimulated the 90s to be the decade of the brain? It, it has to do with technology. You know, the, the brain is not uh, like most of the other organs where doctors can kind of open it up and poke it around and do a couple of things. That, you know, we could do that. We could open up your abdomen. I know not very good the appetizing conversation uh, when you're um, having an after, uh, your, your afternoon lunch. But the brain is a very vulnerable organ. Uh, uh, organ. And so really, until we had CT scans and MRI scans and PEC scans and SPEC scans, some of these scans we weren't able to really look at what was going on with the brain. And so the 1990s was a decade of the brain. And since then, the science and our ability to have better understanding of what's going on um, has grown. It's very exciting um, that even though we're no longer in the decade of the brain, the, the work is still um, growing. And so what we learned, though, in the 90s, what we started learned was that brain development depends heavily on experience. And there are some enduring features uh, that depend heavily on the early experience, learning a second language, musical talent, verbal athletic ability, all of those um, uh, rely a great deal on uh, what we learn and how a child's brain is developed early on. Now, I'm going to say this a little bit later, but don't panic uh, for those of you. We learn throughout the life cycle, and you can learn something new at age 90, but it's harder. There's no question. So all is not lost, but it's harder. And the earlier, the better. Um, actually, that, let me steal something that Dr. Uh, Dr. Schoenkopf said. He said, most of this stuff I'm going to tell you tonight is what your grandmama told you. It's probably grandmama advice. Now, though, we have the science <laughs> to prove that grandmama was right, and, and that's important. Uh, so it all, some of this stuff is almost common sense, but now we have the evidence and the data to show us that grandmama certainly was uh, correct. So we are born with about 100 billion neurons. I mean, those are the nerves, the basic building block of the brain. and. Uh, but that's not enough when we're born. What happens later on is these neurons connect to form synapses, and that really forms the basis of what we can and cannot do as we, uh, as we age. By age three, the brain is 90% of its adult size by age three. But that's just the neurons. They're not connected by age three, or else there'd be three-year-olds in this room. Uh, so <laughs> there has to be a development of period of connectivity, uh, but uh, most of the, uh, the neurons that we have now, we were born with. It's just the trillions and trillions of synapses that are important and allow us to do what we do. And those synapses form. Some of them are pruned back, like pruning trees, like tree, think about tree branches, and I'll have some cool video to show you. Um, and then in the first 10 years, we have 100, uh, uh, 500 trillion to 1,000 trillion. The good news about brain development is it's predictable. It's not haphazard. This was a great 
great deal. And Dr. Shonkoff said this, if you, you know, believe in evolution, you believe that was perfect. And um, if you believe in creationism, you believe the person who created, created this created a wonderful thing. So either way, the brain is a wonderful thing, which is why I chose to go into psychiatry. It's predictable. Normal development requires specific patterns of activity. And you see, you'll see that there are critical periods, though. There are critical periods that if things don't happen in these critical periods, it's not a good thing. Vision, for example, in a very dramatic experiment, which we wouldn't do today, but if we blindfolded a baby, just blindfolded a baby, at the critical time that those brain cells and were connecting and forming, oops, getting away, uh, to form vision, without that input, without that stimulus, the baby would not see, even though because it wouldn't have any visual stimuli to make sure that those synapses connect. So there are some critical periods, and that's just an extreme example of a critical period for uh, development of vision. So this is the neuron I told you about, back to biology 101, and this is the brain as if it were sliced in half. And you probably know this, you see this better on the video. But certainly the brain, um, certain parts of the brain are responsible for certain functions of the brain. So the brain grows bottom up and inside out. So this bottom of the brain, the cortex and the brain stem, is responsible for the things that we need to do from day one breathing. None of us in here are saying, okay, I got to breathe, take a deep breath. You know, these things that are automatic. So our breathing is automatic. Our heart rate is automatic. So all of this happens early on and is controlled by the brain stem. Um, here's the back of the brain that I t told you is responsible for vision. This middle part of the brain is responsible for our emotions. Um, and, you know, babies come, right? How many of you are parents in the room? How many of you have more than one? How many of you had the easy baby first and then the difficult baby? <laughs> so we're hardwired with some of these things, uh, but it's, all is not lost. We can't teach skills, but um, in the amygdala and the hippocampus, you don't need to remember those. Now, this frontal part is the judgment part. I'll show you a little uh, graph on this, but I imagine, let me hear some guesses. At what age does this fully form, the judgment piece? Of course, you guys are really informed, especially in the law, so you understand. About 25. So, those of you who are parents, I know when you take, you, you put your professional hat on, but when you put your parent hat on, just remember. That part is not fully formed until they're 25, which is why what we don't execute children. We do know that children do uh, commit horrific crimes, but we don't execute children. And we, uh, you know, um, this takes the longest to grow. We're the only species where this uh, takes the longest to grow, and where this is a considerable part of our brain. Um, and of course, that's why we have parents. But what if folks don't have caring parents? You see where we're going, and so and this this part is not formed fully until 25. And I know some of you are saying you know some 50 year olds where it's not fully formed, but yes. Um, and so you all are parents, caregivers, are uh, the forebrain, the external forebrain, until folks are able to fully um, develop that frontal cortex. So I think I've made this point. I did want to say something about plasticity, and I have a uh, slide on that later. But again, the earlier the better. Our brain is most malleable, most plastic early on. Uh, again, you can learn a new language at 50. It's easier at three or four. You know, so you can learn any new skill, but it's harder, and it becomes less plastic. And not only that, there's greater effort. So I'll show you a slide a little later. So each of us is the product of an ongoing interaction between nature and nurture. I don't know, remember biology in the seventh grade? There used to be this argument, which is more important, nature and nurture. That argument is no longer uh, fruitful. It's both. 
we can, and you can't do a lot about your genes, we know that, but we can do a lot about the environment, and that's the key, and that's why we're talking here today. But it is a combination of nature, nurture, and the argument about which one is just not a very fruitful argument anymore. And that, that goes with everything. People say, well, why did I get cancer and my brother didn't? Why did this smoker get lung cancer and this? It's nature, nurture, it's a combination, you know, the genes and the environment. So, and that again, just goes for almost everything. And so the key thing for us is, for us, if we have a bad experience, it may alter our functioning, but for children who have bad experiences, those lay the groundwork. Those bad experiences become the foundation of their future functioning. And again, all the more reason for us to be talking here today, chatting, and look at what we can do about this to alter the course if we can. So, let's see if I can show you a fun little video to further illustrate what I just said. We're gonna try this, I might need help. I'm 52, so Jennifer's younger, so she can do this, and you're probably even younger. Do I double click this or? Yeah. Ooh, I, I did. Oh, you right click, right click away from it. So. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. Again, hopefully I've made the point that relationships are the active ingredients of environmental influence on brain development. And again, my guess is most of you know this in here, and, and hopefully what you will do today, though, is be the ambassadors, because this is really important work. And it's really probably the folks that aren't familiar with this or aren't working uh, with children, either in the, the legal system or the child welfare system or the health system. Um, that we need to educate. And so I hope today to give you some tools to go out and be ambassadors so and say well, there is data to show that the work we're doing is very important and we have to intervene in these young children's lives early on and in a consistent, predictable manner or it doesn't uh, uh, foreshadow well for the future. 
So again, it really takes a nurturing, responsive, and individualized interaction to build healthy brain architecture. And again, that, that does provide the foundation for all future learning, future behavior, and, and health. And that excessive and repeated stress, we want to say, because all of us deal with stress, and I'm going to talk about that a little later, and there's normal stress, and stress can be healthy for us, it can motivate us, but the excessive and repeated stress really causes the release of chemicals that then disrupt that brain architecture. And if the brain architecture is disruptive, that's going to cause problems with learning, with behavior, and with health. You know, it's just like when you exercise your biceps and your triceps, and they grow, and they get used, and they're healthy. The muscles that you don't exercise, again, as, that, uh, as the video showed, become pruned away, don't get used. And so let's say early on, kids aren't developing good coping skills. Um, and now we know, see, I think when I first started doing this talk, and I would say this, I have to be honest with you, I wasn't quite sure. Coping skills, is coping skills just environment, or is it biology? And, and I will tell you that when I first started doing this talk, I even thought it was mostly environment. And I think this, the things that I'm going to show you today and what we're learning is coping skills is not just what somebody is, someone is taught, but it really has to do with the environment, which influence the brain architecture. Uh, I remember when I was a resident here and one of my professors, I, I had the good fortune of training here at Emory. We had a real strong psychoanalytic uh, department and psychoanalytic faculty, you know, the Freudian, the whole, let's, ex let's understand human behavior to the nth degree. And then we had a really strong biological psychiatry department. And so I was really fortunate to have both. But I remember one of my professors, um, actually the former chair, who, who mentioned that, and he was just biology, biology, biology. And I said, but what if, again, being country before country was cool, when country wasn't cool, I said, what if actually the biology, the brain changes because of what's going on in the environment? And I remember actually not uh, saying that, but not really asking that again, because I felt stupid and nobody else was saying it. Uh, but really, that is coming true today, that it's just that the experiences can alter, actually alter brain structure. And I think that's what um, we are seeing more and more. Actually, so today, that's not new. But, but 15 years ago, when I was doing this talk, eh, I was a little shaky. As a matter of fact, I, say, I used to say, OK, is this voodoo or not? <laughs> I'm not sure. It might be a little bit of voodoo, but we'll see. And it, and it is certainly not. Um, so let's talk about the interactions. And let's look at this, uh, look, look at this video, hopefully. Let me do this one. The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this develop... What if you could take action to reduce crime, improve health and education levels? You shouldn't let a 52-year-old do this. And put, put, a, put her glasses on. <laughs> This one. The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling, facial expressions, and gestures and adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life, when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. 
This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before. Ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage and serve in return interaction, beginning in infancy, builds a foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior, and health that follow. So, so that's a profound segment. So when you listen to that segment, tell me what you were thinking. Because actually that segment is very scary to me. And I'll tell you why. What worries you about learning this information there? Come on, I, got, I need a brave volunteer. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it says it's serve and return, right? What happens when there is no return? You know, what happened to the orphans in the Romanian, Romanian, or, Romanian orphanages who were fed and clothed and their diapers were changed, but there was no interaction, no kind of serve, volley back. So that, that little three minute clip should worry us all about all the children that we see, that you see, that didn't have that. And again, that informs us about what we need to do uh, when we work with interested caregivers or, or parents of the youth that we're, we're concerned with. Any other comments about that before, before I go on to the next slide? So again, um, the one thing though I don't want to be is doom and gloom. <laughs> because some of you may be saying, oh my God, if we don't get to them by three, they're doomed. Not true. <laughs> however, however, we do have to face a reality. You know, that uh, as I said, the normal brain plasticity does decrease with age. So you can see it's, it's so plastic early on in those first 10 years, uh, but then it de decreases over time. And the effort increases. And of course that makes sense, you know. So it's going to take me a lot longer, even with Rosetta Stone, to learn how to speak French than if my parents had enrolled me in French <coughs> lessons when I was five. Or the piano, which I really do wish my mom had forced me to go into, but she didn't. So let's uh, turn a little bit about to the science of stress, and then we're going to go through a few slides, and then we're going to have a, a break. So I earlier talked about the levels of stress, and there's positive stress. Positive stress was yesterday when I realized I had to complete this talk. So although my heart, you know, I had an increase in heart rate thinking about, you got to finish this talk, this talk is tomorrow, it motivated me to finish the talk. So the, the mild increase in heart rate and the mild elevations in my stress hormone levels, they, they were doable. And when I did complete the talk for today, those uh, stress uh, hormones went down and my heart rate went down. And then there's kind of tolerable stress. So um, the people that were vacationing in Jacksonville uh, yesterday um, were probably in this category because they could have, they faced almost hurricane force winds, not quite, but I'm certain the 24 hours leading up to this, it was tolerable stress. Um, hurricane Katrina, though, those are, would be in the, the uh, category of tolerable stresses. That depends though, but tolerable stressors are came in, hurricane came in, and uh, it's, it's, it's serious, but it's temporary although we know there are some long lasting and that might not be the best example, but temporary stress. Um, and then it, you do well, you survive if you have supportive relationships. See, that's the key. You can do well if you have supportive relationships. And then there's what we are now terming toxic stress, which is this prolonged activation of the stress response system. Now, um, think about this. Think about the time when you were, have been the most frightened in your life. Think about how you felt when you've been the most frightened in your life. When you saw a snake or something else, 
you were riding along the highway and somebody almost swerved into you. What happened? What happens to you when you're confronted with that? Your heart rate goes up, hand sweat, get a knot in your stomach. Right, okay. <laughs> Think about if you lived like that all the time. Just think about that for a moment. If you never knew when the abuse was coming, or you never knew when the next episode of rape or horrible incident was coming, you would be living with that all the time, those elevated hormones in your body, elevated blood pressure, elevated heart rate. You know, it's, we're wired that way because it's protective. It's that fight or flight. If a bear suddenly, uh, Michelle, that reminds me of the time. Remember we saw the bear when we were in Colorado? But it was outside, so it was fun and cute. <laughs> That's right. Because it was great, we all took photos. But if a bear walked into that room right now, we would all have the ability to run. Some of, some of us in the room may decide they want to fight the bear, but whatever your choice, <laughs> your body's preparing you for either fight or flight to protect yourself. However, again, prolonged activation, prolonged episodes of being in that fight or flight mode, just not good. And let's look and understand why. And Jennifer comes so I mean, I might get this right. Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert in the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. So I think, again, these videos are very informative, but I think they show, again, the importance that we have our work cut out for us as we work uh, with children who um, have been exposed to chronic toxic stress. And of course, we're going to include child maltreatment um, as a subset of chronic uh, toxic stress. I think we've made that point. Again, not all gloom and doom. Um, how much of a stress response uh, the body mounts um, is related to a lot of different variables. Again, how long the stress lasts. Is there an interesting, interested caregiver or supportive caregiver around? Um, what have been previous exposures to stress? Um, what does the child have any safe, again, relationships to turn to for support? So again, serious problem, uh, but there is hope, but uh, we do certainly have our work uh, cut out for us. Just a few slides just to hit home the, the point that um, there's been lots of studies recently around early adverse exposures throughout the life cycle, and we know that early exposures is going to lead to early death. 
Studies have shown that. If you look at impaired social, emotional, cognitive development, adoption of high risk, uh, health risk behaviors, disease, disability, social problems, and early death. So we're seeing that. There's the ACE study, how many of you familiar or seen any data from the ACE study um, shows that, again, we can look at uh, uh, sexual promiscuity, perhaps sexual uh, perpetration, alcohol abuse, suicide, uh, smoking, behavioral problems. Now the heart, the PTS, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, probably in that first category, not a surprise to any of you in this room. But I think the new and emerging research gets to some of the other things, not even suicide, but look at heart disease and stroke. Because we're, this whole, that uh, stress re response that I talked to you about and you saw in the video is about inflammation. And so that's a lot of medical stuff. Inflammatory cytokines are going throughout the body. Again, he helpful for a short period of time. Very useful if we have to fight or, or, or flee. But certainly when it gets to that chronic toxic exposure, it can cause problems. And again, and Jack Shonkoff said this in his talk, again, grandmama could have told us that if you have a lot of early adverse experiences, you're more likely to be depressed you're more likely to be anxious. You're more likely not to do well in school. But I think this emerging data regarding diabetes, stroke, cancer, heart disease is significant. Now, not that those diseases are any more important or those problems are any more important than these, but here's the other reality. We also have to oftentimes engage and convince policymakers and the business community. I mean, because we're all probably, I imagine everybody in this room is a do-gooder, right? Uh, when I was a lobbyist at the Capitol for, for Barton, all the do-gooders stayed on one side of the Capitol and all the, I don't know what term I used then, but all the hardcore business lobbyists are on the other side. Now, being a Barton lobbyist, I was a do-gooder lobbyist. But I guess as, an, as a physician, I knew <laughs> that the doctor's lobby was on the other side, you know. So I told all my do-gooder lobbyists, we have to go over on the other side. Seriously, the big boys and girls are playing over on the other side. And we have to go over there. And so, you know, we have to convince business, uh, the business community, and sometimes policymakers that your costs are going to go up for providing health care if you don't address this issue. For us, it's a no-brainer. We're going to address it because it's the right thing to do. But whatever your imperative, uh, it's a moral imperative probably for most of us in this room, but we sometimes have to convince um, other folks um, that it, it affects other things. We, I was, I'm on the governor's task force on obesity, and uh, there was some business community in the room, and they, their ears perked up when someone said, how are we going to attract business to Georgia if we have an obese, if they come to Georgia and have to deal with an obese, uneducated workforce? And the ears perked up. I mean, they were paying attention, but I really saw ears really perk up when we, when we put it in those terms for that group. And, and that's OK. That, that's the way it works. Did you have a question or comment? Well, I, you know, I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm sitting up here, and I'm my stress levels are very high right now. Um, I've been working in the in um, the field of child advocacy now for six years, and prior to that, I was working with children in other capacities. And I have to say, I'm listening to what you have, what you're saying, and I'm saying that I've heard it before. I've heard it before, but the fact of the matter is, I've heard this discussion when they were talking about redoing the, um, what was that, the um, juvenile justice, you know, juvenile code. You know, I heard the concerns, you know, but the bottom line is that when it comes down to the priorities, you know, of the politicians, of the businessmen, no matter how compelling it is when you talk about children and stress, when it comes down to money, you know, they are not willing to commit that. Their attitude seems to be that it's basically the parent's job to deal with the children. You know, so I hear you, and I've heard this, and I'm like, 
we keep talking about it and we keep coming up with you know solutions but one of the reasons why the the new code did not pass was because everybody was in agreement with the solutions but nobody had any um ideas to how the solutions were going to be funded mm -hmm. You know, so tell me something new here. Tell mm -hmm. me what is going to make a difference so that we're not talking about the same thing 10 years from now. Well, there may not be anything new, and in some ways that's good. And I, I get your frustration because I know after years in the, in the struggle, um, it is very frustrating. But um, in, in some ways, I think if your story stays the same and stays consistent over time, it, it, it builds up your credibility. And the, some of the folks we have to convince, uh, we have to talk in a different language, as I said before, but, I, but it does take a long time and I don't want to, um, to, to pretend that it doesn't take a long time. But I, but I have seen change occur with the consistent language with good data behind it. And again, I'm just, just telling you, I saw ears perk up. Not that I believe that, uh, and of course the governor, you know, um, just launched his anti-obesity initiative. Uh, not that I believe things are gonna change overnight, but I will have to tell you in the obesity front, folks are getting frightened when they, they see that by 20, and I can't remember the year 30, you know, some 68% of the, the country is gonna be obese. We are not going to be able to afford it. And this is the same way of a talk. We cannot afford continued incarceration. And I believe, um, and I will take that, the, the governor just signed into law a complete rehaul for, for adults, getting them out of the jails and prisons and more in treatment, those that belong there. There are certain folks that belong in jail. Um, why did they do that? There may have been re many reasons, and I wasn't in the room, but one reason, we couldn't afford it. And when Texas, Texas was one of the states that led on this, and we know how Texas feels about lock them up, throw away the key. They changed it, why? Because they couldn't afford it. So I do believe that if you keep making the argument, but sometimes for different audience, you have to make the argument in a different way. And I think some of these things talk about incarceration. Um, so I, I think we just keep uh, saying the message, but I do acknowledge your frustration. It is it is very difficult because we um, this the parents and you guys are just do gooders. Uh, but I do believe I, I will tell you that Arthur Blank Family Foundation sponsored um, this lecture on building better brains, and we can say Arthur Blank knows a thing or two about businesses. And so, again, the Arthur Blank Family Foundation is different than Home Depot. Of course, you don't own that anymore, or the Atlanta Falcons. But I, I, I do believe I see a shift. It's tiny. Um, and maybe I'm optimistic or the only, and I will tell you that I, have, I decide to have an optimistic view. Um, but I could be wrong. I, I don't know. Does anybody else want to comment on, on that? I mean, I see some changes, but you're right. It's a, you have to be in it for the long haul. Any other any other comments on that? So again, just, just data. And we haven't been, like when I first started doing this again, I didn't have these pictures to show. And, and these are the things where the, the folks that are harder in science and money, uh, now we have pictures to show of the actual brain where we can see a, a healthy brain and an abused brain. Again, when I first started doing this talk, didn't have this photo. Hadn't done this work yet, but they're doing this, this work to show from a medical perspective. We all know we may be about to, and I will say that uh, regardless of what the Supreme Court does in June, health care has to change. It's unaffordable. Our current system is not sustainable. And everyone agrees on that piece. And so these are the things that we know we cannot continue to um, business as usual. It's just if we, unless we want to bankrupt the country, which although there's no agreement on how to get out of it, Nobody, everyone realizes that we um, have to make some changes so that we don't uh, bank, bankrupt our country. So again, just a few other things and then we'll have a break. Just more science, you probably had enough of science and we're, talking, we're gonna talk about maybe some solutions. But I mean, this study shows that, and this, uh, that if you have significant adversity, um, again, and you have a number, depending on the number of risk, risk factors, look at the children with developmental delays. So one to two risk factors, three, four, but look at seven. 
So if you have that many uh, risk factors on this adversity scale from that study, 90%, almost 100% of the children had some developmental delay. I, can, I have the study here, so I can give you those. Yes. Treat or address developmental delays or academic deficiency when it's coming from stress versus just being in foster care. Because a lot of our clients that we see have educational issues, and it's either from just being shifted around, but how do we treat that differently from a child who's been abused significantly and is coming in foster care? Or do we treat it differently? You don't. Yeah. You, would, you treat it the same way. So you don't have to get to the root of the issue to you look at the way it's manifesting itself, not the root to help treat it. Well, you want to prevent whatever the cause is. And so if the cause is, um, you were saying, being abused, then you want to get the child out of the, you know, out of the situation. If it's the stress, source of stress is this is your 20th home, uh, you want to develop a system and see sometimes it's not on the individual level and they're re re this is also about macro not just micro because actually just micro is not going to cut it so there has to be macro system changes here and that's what folks in this room i'm sure you've been work we we've, we've been working on for many years and it's it's improved um, i'm less uh, knowledgeable about it as i used to be when i was at barton um, I remember we were, you know, down there lobbying for more uh, caseworkers, so there would be a decrease uh, caseworker to child ratio. Uh, but these are these are definitely systemic issues. We won't be able to do it if we just focus on the micro, although the micro is important. And again, this heart disease deal is just is 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 just new and fascinating to me because. Who would have thought that stress um, and some of these issues, we know depression, but really increasing heart disease and cancer and all those things. And so they looked at the percent of, a, uh, percent of adult, adults with this biological marker. That marker was C-reactive protein. That's Some of you may know what that is, but they measured, but you could actually measure in the blood because people always say, psychiatrists, you, you know, is there a test? I say, no, I don't have a blood test. And we can't do an MRI or a CT scan. Uh, but they actually uh, looked at the C-reactive protein, drew blood, took the level of C-reactive protein for this study, and, and showed that those who had a higher C-reactive protein had these other issues. So again, more and more, the science, again, is, concern, is confirming what, uh, what Grandmama told us. So again, we want to stop there. If you have any burning questions, um, I can answer those now. We're going to get to uh, maybe trauma-informed care. Uh, PTSD is something that I have believed for many years is underdiagnosed. You know, there's always a controversy about ADHD and the medications, and that's not mainly the focus of this talk, but we can chat about that in the question and answer period. But I've always said, and, and uh, uh, Folks who heard me say this years ago can vouch for this. I used to say, all these kids have PTSD until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. Just like when I was an intern and I was at Grady, all these young black males were coming in. And uh, one of the best things my professor, uh, chair of biology, he said, because there's always this issue of black men being overdiagnosed with schizophrenia, and he said to us as interns, young black male comes into Grady, psych ER with psychosis, their bipolar disorder till proven otherwise. And there's lots of reasons why that's important. But so this is, this is what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that everybody agrees with me. Let me let you know that. But I think you start with PTSD and then disprove that. And then you go to some other things. But we'll, we'll stop right there for a 10-minute uh, break. And if you have any questions you want to come up and ask me, I'll be happy to take them, and I'll, we'll come back at 3.15. Okay. You have a lot of these slides in your uh, packet, of course. You have all these slides in your packet. I'm, I'm going to skip through some slides, especially those slides that give you just a little bit more detail on what you might find more in a school-aged child versus a preschool child. And in the question and answer uh, period, if you have any specific questions. Um, but, you know, I think the, the bottom line is, and, and there are some generalizations, but really oftentimes you have to deal with these uh, cases on an individual 
individual basis. You know, there are some things, uh, types of trauma and stresses that cause children to be more externalizing. When we talk about externalizing, we mean acting out behaviors. And then there are some that cause the victim to be more internalizing. So sometimes you might wonder, this little girl hasn't said it. In general, girls are more internalizing and boys are more externalizing. So little boys will act out and be aggressive and, you know, jump around and hit and fight. And girls maybe again, this is generalizations that don't cover 100% of cases, but girls are more internalizing, quiet, uh, focused, um, inward. Um, so just we, we can answer some of those general questions later if you have. But again, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, again, first diagnosed in uh, it, uh, returning war vets. Uh, but now we know that trauma is trauma is trauma. Um, and so I do believe, as I've said before, that we really need to look at PTSD more in these children. Um, they may have ADHD. Let me be the first to say I do believe ADHD is a diagnosis. And if diagnosed appropriately, uh, medications can help. I am not one of those psychiatrists who believe that medication are the panacea. As a matter of fact, at our child and adolescent clinic, we have our parents sign a contract. Of course, all the lawyers in the room, it's not binding. But our, our, our point is to say, you're not gonna drop your child off here, not in this way, but I'm not, be, you're not gonna drop your child off here and just have us fix them with the pill. You're going to have, are we still doing that, Jenna? Yes. Something I, uh, you know, when you get further and further away, um, you know, you're going to have to be engaged as a family person because the best and the data shows um, that uh, for folks who, uh, who meta, for whom medication is appropriate, usually a combination of medication and the appropriate talk therapy um, works best. So we'll just leave that at there, at that there and go on, but again, PTSD, first you gotta have, of course, an exposure to the trauma, and then some are one of these symptoms, re-experiencing, um, typically the sort of classic symptom is Vietnam vets who believe they're actually back in Vietnam. That's a re-experiencing. Avoidance, these folks tend to avoid people, activities, you know, folks stay at home, not wanna go anywhere. Um, and then increased, increased arousal. So if someone would drop a book in here, all of us would probably startle. Um, but you see folks with PTSD who have what we call an exaggerated startle. So while most of us would jump six inches out of our seat, folks with PTSD would jump three feet. You know, so there's always an exaggerated reaction to, to a stimulus. And again, I do um, believe that uh, that is underdiagnosed and we sh we're missing uh, a lot of that, especially in children who have been uh, mal maltreated. Uh, but of course, ADHD, major depression, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct, separation anxiety, all those uh, can occur uh, at the same time as PTSD. So I'm gonna have uh, Jennifer talk a little bit about uh, trauma and trauma-informed care, and then we're gonna talk about what, what should we be doing? What should we be thinking about the future? Um, you, you know, we've got kids now that we're dealing with, but again, prevention is always better than treatment and intervention. So how can we move the needle way down, um, uh, way down the road and, and, and do some preventive work? All right, so we talked some now about trauma-informed care. Um, my name is Jennifer Bartle. I'm the program manager at Oak Hill. It's our child, adolescent, and family counseling center. Um, some of what trauma-informed care starts with is, is really some sort of hands-on, concrete things that you can do for families. Um, I think with a lot of our kids, and especially in schools, and, and folks are skeptical of making referrals for therapy, and it's just talk therapy, and you're just going to sit and, and talk about your problems, and that's going to make everything better. Um, it doesn't work that way, and, and we believe, um, along with the State Department of Behavioral Health and, Disabil Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, that uh, using evidence-based practices, uh, things that we know have been tested and, and, and known to work, um, is a much better bet than just, quote-unquote, talk therapy. Um, 
Trauma-informed care uh, can be used in multiple settings across multiple disciplines, specifically in behavioral health, in residential treatment, uh, in the juvenile courts, and in the schools. And <clears throat> when I'm done, I'll talk some about what we're doing uh, in one of the schools that we're working in that's pretty exciting and I think innovative. Uh, psychoeducation is just helping children and their parents learn about trauma, what trauma is, what are the different types of trauma, why does trauma happen, um, what are the effects of trauma, and why children may not like to talk about it. I think sometimes we get parents who come in and they're sort of at their wit's end. Um, if, if a child has had a, a very typical trauma, um, child sexual abuse, uh, a rape, a sexual assault, that sort of thing, there's automatic empathy for that. That's a horrible thing that happened to you. I can pinpoint the day and the, the time that that trauma happened to you, and then I can work to treat it, right? We've got the Georgia Center for Child Advocacy that provides uh, free forensic interviewing and uh, counseling for kids who've had that sort of trauma. But if your trauma is that you live in a, in a quote unquote bad neighborhood, um, that you hear domestic violence happening in the apartment above you and below you and maybe to the left of you. If domestic violence is happening in your apartment, um, if you're witnessing murders uh, in your community, if you're witnessing gang violence, those aren't things that families can quote, you know, really pinpoint. Here's the one day that this one bad thing happened that we feel really bad about and we want to get you help for. Um, and so I think that what I've learned about trauma-informed care is that it, it kind of adds that empathy that I think sometimes folks who've been working in the field for a while, we forget about. If you're working in schools or in uh, juvenile justice, you can get to that place where you're considering these sort of bad kids and not really getting to that piece of what Dr. Harris spoke about, where really there's maybe some PTSD reactions going on and some responses to things that they're seeing in their environment. Um, that, that can be addressed. Um, there's techniques for psychoeducation, which is general education uh, about abuse and trauma, specific uh, information about the traumatic event, so getting the kids to identify what that is, um, sex education and risk reduction for kids who've had, uh, who are victims of sexual trauma. Then there's stress management, and this is something that uh, we're just seeing great results with. Um, the first thing that starts is controlled breathing, and this is just, and if everyone could do this with me, put your ha one hand, doesn't matter left or right, one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly, and you just breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. I'm a little congested and can't talk and breathe <laughs> at the same time, so you all do it with me. <laughs> so we teach kids how to do that. We um, we can put, a, you can have them lay down, maybe put a toy on their chest so they can visually see. Um, you know, we don't, we don't think about breathing. Um, you spoke about, you know, what, what can we do? What, what are some, some tangible techniques that we can do? This is something that you can do in a classroom. This is something that you could do in the courtroom with families. This is something that you can teach parents to do, uh, not only to teach the child, but also how, uh, for, for themselves. Uh, relaxation training. We do um, muscle relaxation, progressive muscle relaxation, where you tense up one part, then you tense up the next part, you know, start with your arms, your shoulders, and then down to your legs, your toes, and then you let go. You do that again, teaching kids how that works, why that works. Thought stopping is another technique that works really well. Um, does anyone want to give an example of a, a trauma, one that's group shareable? <laughs> Um, that they, I don't know, maybe not even a trauma, something bad that happens that you get stuck in your head that you can't stop thinking about. Physical abuse. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, physical abuse. Um, when, when, of course, once the abuse has ended, but you're, you know, so imagine you're a child and you're in school and, you know, you gave the example of a, a loud book or another fight that happens in the classroom. Every other kid sees that fight that happens in the classroom, hears that loud noise, they're momentarily startled, and then they move on. But the child who's been physically abused is having a really hard time letting go of now. He's back in that place uh, where the bad thing happened. Thought stopping is something that you can teach a child where they can find a word that works for them, go away thoughts, leave me alone thoughts. Um, some kids use a rubber band on their wrists like they actually need a tactile a reminder. And you say, stop. 
and, and you're telling your brain, hey, I don't want to think about that right now. I don't want to talk about that in my, I don't want to have that conversation in my head. Let me stop that and get back to what I'm doing. So if I'm in school, um, so for kids who are in school, this is something that you can use to help them get back on track with their homework, get back on track in their classroom or in their schoolwork. Coping skills, identifying the difference between thoughts and feelings and how your thoughts affect your behavior, and then helping children generate a more accurate or helpful thought. We do a trauma narrative with kids, and this is where you do a poem or you can write a book or make up a song, something that tells the story of the trauma. This is a long process. I'm just giving you the snapshot of it. But what it does is it helps kids tell the story of their trauma. Whatever that trauma is, it makes it real for them. It makes it, as an adult, you're saying, I understand that this happened to you, and that it's real, and that it's awful, and let's move, help you move past it. Um, that's a long process, but it's something that you work with the child, and then you have the child present that trauma narrative to their parent, if they have a caring parent or a caring, a par a caring caregiver. Um, and then you teach behavior management. We don't do anything um, in our clinic or in the schools or anywhere that we work that we don't involve the parents. Um, so we're bringing parents in, we're teaching them how to work with their children, we're teaching them why they're seeing the behaviors that they're seeing, what they can do about it, where those behaviors come from, and then some tips and techniques that they can use to sort of modify that. Um, we're working in a, a school now, um, I won't name the school, but it's in a not, not great part of town. They've had, uh, last time I was there, they had had three murders within the last three days within four blocks of the school. So imagine you're a child at that school. Um, that school is really the only safe place for those kids. Um, so the teachers have told me that, you know, kids come Monday, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're kind of a mess. They're all over the place. By Friday, they've gotten them back to a safe place, a sane place, a, a place where they're practicing their skills. They go home. Don't let it be a long weekend. <laughs> um, they don't want Monday off. They want to come back to <laughs> These are the kids that want to come back to school. So I've been to the school several times. What they do, most schools, kids who have the free and reduced lunch, which this school is 98% free and reduced lunch, they have the uh, breakfast in the classroom. So you come in, you do your attendance, you go to your classroom. These kids, they've opened up the school early. And let me, you know, kind of goes without saying, this school has bought into trauma-informed care. They get it, they see how it works, they, they're invested in it. So they open up the school early, kids come, they have their breakfast in the cafeteria, and they do yoga. And every morning they have at least 75 kids that are out, lined up outside to do the yoga. So they do their breakfast, they have social workers in the, in the room there to sort of debrief what may have happened over the weekend. Um, and then they do yoga, and these kids, <laughs> They came and they did a presentation for us. And I'd never seen anything like it. I do yoga. It, it works for me. I, I, it's helpful for me. But to see it in a child that's experienced trauma and to see the things that they do to make themselves feel better in that place. So at this school, you may come to a classroom and some kids are teaching and some kids are doing what you're doing. And other kids are standing literally and they're doing this. And that balancing, I'm holding on because I don't want to fall in front of you, <laughs> but that balancing technique that they're doing with the permission of the teacher, it's helping them to calm themselves down. Um, it's fascinating. And that's just one you know, technique that they've used. So that's a school where we'll be working, um, taking some of our trauma-informed care techniques. Um, any questions about trauma-informed care, how it works, why it works? Yes. How old are the students that you're working with? This is an elementary school, so they're 5 to 11, maybe 12. So would it be fair to say when they get a little older, like say if you tried to, or if they were implementing the same thing in middle school, even high school, they may not be as receptive to it, or? Um, again, I take the sort of glass half full and sort of positive approach. So I would say that any child would be receptive to it. Maybe not yoga, though. Maybe it's something else. Um, I, I think you have to work with your population and see what works for them. These kids, I think they love the yoga instructor. She's very um, unique. <laughs> and so that fit for them. They feel good about it. It's not a, um, it's not something that you, 
how do I say this? It's not like, like basketball where you feel like you have to master it. I'm not good at it. I think as soon as you start doing yoga and you feel good about it, you don't feel like I'm having to be better than the next. That's an adult thing. Kids don't get that competitive about yoga. Like, am I doing it right? Am I, is my balance off? So I think it feels, I think it feels good to them. But I think you would have to, A, have the buy-in of the school and, and have somebody who's innovative and creative to figure out what would work with that population. Maybe it's not yoga. Any other questions, thoughts, or comments about that? Okay, thank you. Oh, I went, forgot to say that these are two resources and they're in your, uh, they're in your handout that are great uh, for any of you that are uh, working with kids or working in the juvenile court in the mental health unit, those sorts of things. This is a great resource on trauma. Yes? One quick question. Do you teach these kids the uh, DBT, the dialectical behavior therapy? We're just learning that uh, on my team. That's, uh, we, we have three evidence-based practices that we were really focusing on, and that's one of them. Um, that also works really well with uh, children who've been victims of sexual exploitation. That's been our focus on it. Yeah, Jennifer said a couple of things that I think are very important. You have to meet the child, the adult, where, where they are. And if they are just, that yoga thing is too weird. You, know, you have to find something. And that's why, um, you know, I'm certainly a believer in grandmama's wisdom. But therapy is not grandmama's wisdom. Some people think therapy is common sense. But people go to school for many years and get specific training. And they're at, at least, at, and I could only speak for my team. And I know this doesn't happen everywhere. But um, my team is only... Um, allowed to do evidence-based therapy. They can't do anything where there's not good sign from a trusted sort like, like SAMHSA or CDC or the American Psychiatric Association or the American Academy or the National Association of Social Workers. So we really have to be, I'm, I'm very careful about that. And uh, I imagine that probably makes my team sort of slow in adopting the latest and the greatest. But I just believe that we have to have uh, the therapy. And you know, I, I believe one of the greatest lessons I learned in medical school, one of my professors said, doctor, don't be the first to prescribe a new medication or therapy, and don't be the last. So I am, so I'm telling you about me. I'm conservative, kind of in the middle. I want to make sure that there's data, because there's lots of, and I, I used to tell the story about um, that regression therapy, remember the regression therapy, and some therapists decided they were going to make some kids and be in a blanket and somebody died, and you know, then that other thing that happened out there. So there's a lot of folks out there who hang their shingle and have a belief in something, but it's not, or therapy is not evidence-based. So that's my personal bias. You can disagree with that, but you had a follow-up question? You don't play it. You just play one on TV. <laughs> so I'm not trying to ask these complex questions, but as far as the brain being more malleable, you talked about it being more malleable at a younger age, mm -hmm. the learning things. Is that the same with therapeutic strategies? Like, do you see a child kind of be more receptive to certain ther therapies um, at a certain age versus when they get older? Because a lot of times, my colleague and I were talking about this. Like, we have teenage clients who, of course, have gone through a lot of trauma, and sometimes you kind of see them being callous. And I know sometimes it's defense mechanism, but is it also something that you can see in the brain as far as them receiving it uh, literally? I don't think I would look at it that way. I would look at that more as just experience and maybe, um, yeah, uh, you know, and maybe even testing you. Yeah, that's the last person said this. The last person said they were going to help me. The last attorney, the last social worker, the last doctor. Let me see. You know, because that less, the longer you're in this system and get more and more callous, use the word, then it does, and it's more frustrating than it does take an extra effort to, you know, because you build up a wall. Because the wall is adaptive. Remember, if you have gone through the ninth foster care home, why put yourself out there and develop that relationship? with it only to have it uh, disrupted again and again. So some of it's not really about the brain plasticity, but really a defense mechanism that's really adaptive at some point. And uh, again, that's why prevention um, you know, is best. But now we do have a cohort of folks that we're all dealing with right now from the age of whatever, from zero until you know, 21, probably some of us. And it just takes a team 
I would say, I don't know if this person's in therapy, but a team of um, working with this kid, finding the one person, you know, that the kid may, uh, may want to talk to, maybe a mentor. So it really takes some sort of creative out of the box thinking for somebody to break through. But I think it's just building up that wall and that defense mechanism after so many, uh, you know, opportunities where the person's been hurt. You know, why would they? It doesn't make sense for them to trust. Yeah. So, so this is what the light bulb moment went off for me when I was at this presentation at the Blank Foundation. So if we really want to improve the lives, what are we doing? And he says this to me. Here's the, the take home message. He said, you know what? We are very good at giving out information but we're not very good at skill building. And I said, hmm, let me, because we, 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 we train, again, I'm giving you out information today, but he said we really have to move away from sharing information and giving out information and more toward, a, a, you know, a, a skill building. Because, you know, the three stool, we have to en enhance the quality and access to services. We have to expand the effective models. He also talks about we're in an academic setting, and he, he was, of course, at Harvard, and he said we're very good at, um, finding the right therapy that worked for that particular group in that cohort, in that study of, I don't know, let's give it a number, 300. Sometimes it's not that many. And he said, and then what do we do in the academic community? And I'm not an academic, but I'm telling you what he said. We write more papers about it. And he said, and then if we try to take it to scale, what we do is we say, all right, let's take it a scale, let's pick this group. They won't have the, the same amount of money that we have, and we don't have the money to give them the training that we, we uh, you know, had in the study. And, we will, and so we can't, and we'll, in, in the study, we work with 300 kids, and they're going to do 800 kids. And then what happens? It doesn't work. And so he, he talked about that and said, we really have to do a better uh, job of that. But so this is the hypothesis, and I, I like his hypothesis, is that, um, you know, we, we have the, the parenting education and, and, and not, don't throw that out. Don't throw the things that we're doing out. But he said we need to add to. So we need to add to the per parent education. We need to add to WIC, you know, and the sound nutrition, the stimulating experiences, and the health promoting environments. He said, but that's not enough. We need to do something about this adversity, he said, because that's why things don't work in the, when they worked, and I'm, he didn't say this, but when they worked in that upper middle class neighborhood in um, Alpharetta, and they're not working um, in, uh, in off of, of uh, what's the street? Bankhead. They changed the name, I think. But um, so we really have to do something about this this significant adversity. That's hard. That's hard. And he says we don't know how to do it yet. But that's where he thinks we need need to go. And I think I talked to you about the social determinants of health. And he said it's just more. Uh, than our current strategies that we are, are doing right now, but we have to do, and this is the hard work, and this is the work of more than the people in this room, economic stability, I mean, that gets to the business community. Those executive functioning skills, that's the skill building. And he pointed out that the good news is, remember I said it is harder to learn when you're older, but there are two blips, that early blip, but then adolescence, adolescence, is another blip where kids have this spurt where they can learn. So all again is not lost. And so we can, um, there is a time in adolescence that's very important. We can probably make a difference. Um, strength and mental health, of course, he's a pediatrician, but of course, as a child psychiatrist, I like that. I think this is probably preaching to the choir in this room, but you all know that that's a toughie. Mental health is always underfunded. And I'll be the first to admit there's not enough child psychiatrists. There's not going to be enough child psychiatrists in our lifetime. And so we really have to look at the team-based approach to care um, with, um, you know, the psychiatrist. And this is my bias. I'm admitting that the leader of the team, but the team-based approach to care um, on these issues. 
And so he talks about the, that frontal lobe. Remember, it, it's, it is the air traffic control system. And he believes that this is where we have the ability to do the skill building, not just give the information, but do the skill building. And so this is what we, um, again, this is a little blip. So see that blip in adolescence? See that upward? That means that there's a chance. Now, it's certainly not as great as that chance. Um, in those first, what, uh, eight years or so. But there is a second blip um, where um, there's an opportunity to build executive skills. And so working with those adolescents, um, those jaded, calloused adolescents, all is not lost. Somebody was going to make somebody. So again, this was his schematic, and I like this, but he says, if we want health and development across the lifespan, again, we have to look at this. This is the logic model. We have to have uh, policy and program levers for innovation, which is what they're doing at ha uh, Harvard. And you know, Emory, and I think our you know, institutions that have gravitas and funding, uh, this is my personal opinion, um, should lead us on this. Um, we have to build the caregiver and community capacities. So it's not just the individual level, as I talked about before, it's the macro level. And I'm going to talk about what we're doing in Fulton County to build community capacities. And I have to tell you that my light bulb went on. And that once I tell you about what we're doing in Fulton County, I'm going to try to bring some of the things that he said to the work that we were already planning on doing in Fulton County. So I'll show you that in a little. Uh, in a little bit. So we have to, again, uh, make sure we build foundations for healthy development, look at these biological adaptations or disruptions, and then, again, look across the lifestyle, preconception, prenatal. At Fulton County, we, we talk about, um, and really with on the public health side, between the public health side and the behavioral health side, we are looking at health, again, from preconception uh, through adulthood. But we used to say on the behavioral health side, we'll treat you from negative 9 to 99. Uh, because really, if you're starting, that brain starts to develop, develop you know, prenatally. Uh, and so that's important. And you all know the effects of alcohol on, on brain development. So we have an exciting opportunity in Fulton County. Um, we, here's the, okay, how many of you? have brought children over. How many of you work in Fulton County or work with children who live in Fulton County? OK. So how many of you had have children come over to our Center for Behavioral Health Care? OK. Well, so this is a 22-acre campus. Um, it used to be the it used to be the shelter. Michelle, do you remember when it was the shelter? Yeah. Fulton County defects. Yeah. Well, yes, yes, and that was, Fulton County wasn't in charge, <laughs> Fulton County government. But, um, you know, it was closed down, it needed to be, it wasn't a safe place, and we had the decree. And so the county, my boss is the seven board of commissioners, renovated a couple of cottages, and we've been providing behavioral health care out of the college cottages. A couple of years ago, Fulton County got a D in, health dis in addressing health disparities. And my seven-member um, uh, board of commissioners found that unacceptable and said, what are we doing in the county? We can't do it all, but what are we doing? And long story short, we totally developed our internal processes. We formed a health and human services agency. We got out of our silos. I used to be the medical director of behavior health. Never did I talk to my colleagues at public health. I'm a child psychiatrist. That's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed to tell that story. We have a housing team, a library team. We never talked. So we got out of that. The three directors, uh, I became the uh, director for behavioral health and public health. Troy White's the director for housing and human services. And John Zabo is the director for libraries, quality of life, and cooperative extension. And so we formed the Health and Human Services Agency. And we are building and are renovated what we call integrated service centers. Our next one is opening June 7th in the Adamsville community. Adamsville Regional Health Center, Public Health, Behavior Health, West End Medical Center for Primary Care, Dental Health, Housing Assistance, Employment Assistance, Literacy Assistance, WIC, 
So we're so very excited about what we're doing. And that was for adults, although children will be able to go there. But I'm a child psychiatrist, and I really wanted to do this for the kids. And so we are building an integrated care center just focusing on children with a focus on four things. Obesity, asthma, socio-emotional health, which is everything we've talked about today, and uh, youth literacy, because we know that folks used to build prisons based on the number of young boys who could not read in the third grade. They could accurately predict, accurately predict how many prison beds they need to build based on the number of third grade boys who cannot read. And so we have decided we are going to stop that pipeline. We're really gonna be focused on prevention at Fulton County. So here is the architectural rendering of what we're doing. This is the medical wing. This is behavioral health, doctors, therapists, after school, summer therapeutic program. This is the central administrative wing. Over here, exam rooms, primary care. We're trying to get a major pediatric partner to come and join us uh, for our obesity initiative. Um, uh, primary care, public health on this side, our teen clinics on this side. Um, this is on the first floor, on the bottom floor, dental, oral health care on this side over here. What's a major barrier to families coming in and getting services, bringing all of their children? Over here, a child care drop-off center. So if you come with more than one child, the other children who are not receiving services uh, can be dropped off there. Uh, this is the education wing. I talked about health literacy, youth literacy, reading at the third grade, and employment. Troy White, my counterpart, has this entire wing focused on youth employment services. This is the education wing. You can see lots of classrooms. Dr. Schoenkopf, and I built this, um, I designed this before he came, but I said, wow, he talked about skill building. All of these classrooms, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing scale building. So I hope to continue a relationship with him and figure out a way, uh, really look at what he's doing and, and can we bring some of that to uh, the Fulton County. I haven't chatted with him about that, so I don't want to pretend that I have. And they may say we don't want to have anything to do with it. But I, I liked his model and that inspired me and I felt we were going in the right direction. Um, and this is our public health uh, staff mainly. We didn't have enough space for WIC over here. I was very disappointed, but we ran out of space. We are very excited about this place. Teaching Kitchen. Nutrition, health, teaching kitchen, and right out here, which you can't see on this plan, community garden. Kids are going to grow their own vegetables. Jennifer's doing some of this now. They grew some herbs in pots and made pizzas. And so we're teaching them this now. And we know healthy nutrition is, talked with one of you in the um, in the meantime, so uh, community garden, teaching kitchen, and this is Troy gets Troy wine, so I gave him both levels over here for his uh, <laughs> workforce development. So we are very excited. This is the gymnasium. So when the kids who come to us with obesity and their medical plan is working out, there's going to be a huge ball field on the outside, but if the weather is too hot or too cold, they will be able to be in the gymnasium. These are just architectural renderings. I hope it looks, you know how the architects do, I hope it looks something like this. <laughs> but we're very excited um, about what we're doing at Fulton County and I believe and I'm committed again, that was my light bulb moment and he came about two months ago and I do plan to keep in touch with him and uh, see if we can't learn from what they're doing at Harvard and bring that to uh, the children of Fulton County. So um, thank you very much today. It was a honor and a pleasure to speak before you today on behalf of myself and Jennifer. Thank you. And we're open for questions. Yes. You mentioned DBT was one of the evidence-based practices. What are the other two that you endorse? Oh, it's on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and seven challenges, which is a um, curriculum that addresses substance abuse, education, uh, prevention, and early intervention. Thank you. 
You're welcome. What do you think about um, the Sunday using cortisol levels or, or something like that in a court case to mm. basically it's, it's maybe prove deprivation? Do you, is that anywhere even on the... I just was thinking about some of the stuff that um, the doctor from Harvard spoke about, and it's, he was saying that we're pretty close to being able to measure toxic stress. And I was wondering if that is something that you see possibly in our, in our career as an evidence thing. Or is that really out, out there question? I don't, I don't think it's out there. I'm not sure it's going to be in our career, but but you never know. And you know, you you have folks that are looking at this. But I mean, they're able to measure these things now. The question is, and especially you know, in a court case, you know, it has it, there there almost is a higher uh, level of um, scrutiny once medical stuff gets into to the legal system versus into our everyday practice. So my guess is it will get into our everyday practice before it's allowed to be introduced into uh, court. But, but I, I think I can see it happening. I mean, this whole thing about personalized medicine and, and genetics, and now we, you know, we have the human genome mapped, and you know, now there, there are scary parts to that because, you know, if 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 your insurer knows your your genetic makeup, and you are 70% likely to get diabetes, 20% likely to get this, 10% likely to get this, we have to make sure that the ethics keeps up with the science, and that's a chronic problem in medicine. A lot, probably lots of things is ethics doesn't always keep up, because we wouldn't want folks to be discriminated against. Oh, I'm not gonna give you insurance because you're 70% likely to get diabetes. So you have to be careful about that, but I think some exciting things are on the horizon, both medical field and then the, the practical um, implications for, for the legal system. I mean, you know, we don't execute, you know, juveniles because folks are understanding this about the brain. And, you know, I've testified in a couple of cases where the judges are saying, and I think I spoke to the judges about, well, I don't know, 10 years ago, and they're getting it now about the executive functioning and not that we are excusing bad behavior, but we're understanding it and then saying, maybe this kid needs this and this kid need, needs something else, but not necessarily lock them up and throw away the key. In addition to we can't afford that anymore. Um, you said you are using yoga, so I'm assuming that's, that's evidence-based to reduce stress levels. That's something that's happening at the school, and that's a school-based initiative um, that I'm excited to, to take part in. I think uh, there's evidence-based, and then there's what's called promising practices. And I think that some of that holistic stuff, they're looking at how promising that is, um, but it's not called, quote, unquote, evidence-based yet. I just wondered, though, if you had any other suggestions for things that are effective in evidence-based or in common practice for reducing cortisol, especially when it was well, we do uh, in our after school, in our uh, clubhouse program, which is our substance abuse program, we're trying to do things that are sort of thinking outside the box. So, for example, right now we're doing uh, a program that we've called TRI, Technology Reaches Youth. Um, it's, it's been interesting to watch because this is a project that we've been trying to get going for several years and it, it's finally um, gotten some legs. Um, kids who've been coming to the after school clubhouse program, um, you know, they're sort of there begrudgingly. <laughs> um, they participate in group, and they participate in seven challenges group. Most of them are mandated by the juvenile court to be there. We started this Technology Reaches Youth program where they could do either a photography project or a public service announcement. The seven kids got together who don't normally like each other, um, don't want to be there. They did a public service announcement on the importance of um, protecting yourself and having um, using condoms, which is a topic that they came up with. They come on Saturdays to film this public service announcement. They stay late. They come early. Uh, kids who you give a MARTA pass to and they can give you every excuse as to what happened to it, they've got their MARTA pass and they're there early and they're ready to learn. So I think um, it's about finding something that connects with them. And then in that, so it's not a, you know, sitting across from a kid and saying, well, how did that make you feel? And tell me more about that. <laughs> that it's more of a, you know, and engaging them in something that they find meaningful. Uh, and then they start telling you things. It's been fascinating. So, so, so yoga is, um, 
yoga, progressive muscle relaxation, deep breathing are all things that any of us might do to reduce our stress. And so um, what work, yoga may work for some, yoga may not work. Some people run, some people exercise, some people read, some people meditate, some people pray. And so again, it's what, you know, meeting the person where they are, finding out what they're interested in, these kids, this was something that interests them. So, so you, you really can't look and say, yo, oh, yoga worked, and so yoga will work for everyone. It really is, and this is the hard work that we do, it's individual. Um, you know, which is why you really need a good evaluation um, and uh, some help with some folks who have some experience in various forms of therapy. And what works for one person might not work for the other. Um, and so it really, it, it, it's some trial and error of finding a match. But as Jennifer said, if you let the adolescents especially lead you, they will eventually lead you, but you have to break through a lot of that defense callousness mechanisms. and all the defense mechanisms. In residential, they do equine therapy. Um, at Inner Harbor, they do the drumming circles. Um, that's not for everybody, uh, the deep breathing thing. Some kids can't sit still long enough to do the, the deep breathing, or they get distracted, or they giggle. <laughs> so you have to find what fits. I work with Truman's. I'm an attorney. I work with Truman's in Fulton County on a, for TIP. And it's okay. so hard. You know, there's. I'll try to text them if they give me a phone number that works. And it's, it's really hard to establish any sort of consistent form of communication with them. And, and by and large, the most time I spend is before court uh, and, and after court. Um, do you ever see any of the, I know truancy is not as big of a problem maybe as some of the other issues we've been talking about, but do you ever see any of those kids? Because they, they just, they aren't engaged. And I don't, I don't know what, you know, the court could order under the, in their supervision orders could add to it, you know, aside from tape tests and community service. And, Something that would, enough. yeah, something that would be engaging for them. That's definitely a gap. Services for adolescents. We have an after school program, and there are several good after school programs in the county. Um, after about age 11 or 12, those kids just aren't interested. Those middle schoolers, when they see our van pull up, they, 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 they go the opposite direction. Um, yeah, so absolutely, you know, after, after school program for, you know, they feel like it's babysitting. So uh, finding some way to engage them, um, I think you know, is the key. And there it probably happens more on a one-on-one -on -one basis than it does in a group. Well, the hotel would the workforce <clears throat> development, because the kids that I have, they just want to work. Absolutely. If their parent had taken them out or their guardian had withdrawn them from the school system before that petition was filed or before they were 16 and accrued sufficient absences, they could just be doing their own thing. You know, it probably would get us in trouble, but they wouldn't be under supervision until they're essentially 20. No, I think workforce development, development is a good piece, and that's been something that, you know, we talked about silos that we haven't, I haven't in my program done a great job with youth workforce development and, and partnering with those folks at Fulton County who do just that. So I'm very excited about having them on our campus to say, okay, here's this population of kids where there is a gap, maybe workforce is, is what's it for them. And we're going to force that in some way because um, they won't be able to participate in the youth uh, employment program unless they at least get an assessment from, by our team. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's forced. Um, and, you know, we can't force folks to therapy and you have to meet kids where they are, but at least we'll know what some needs are and we can strategize about a way to, to meet them where they are. And it might be athletics. It might be... Um, you know, rapping, I mean, I actually, one of the reasons I listen to rap is try to understand what our kids are listening to and understanding and, and using that. And I, there was a show on, and I, I don't know if I told Jennifer to watch it, but um, about a couple of um, folks in New York and New Jersey um, working with some high school boys and trying to find the things that matter to them. And that, that's very difficult, there's no question, because the competition is is strong um, for young black males, which is again uh, getting to prevention. And again, that's a longer term view. We've got kids to deal with now, but you know we got to get to the point where that's a smaller and smaller group that we work with. And again, that is a 20, 10, 20 year view. Part of I think also, and I, I see you in the back. Um, what works, f what and what makes sense for me with trauma informed care is it really it gives you a better feel for for what kids go through. And so if you can look more globally at what trauma these kids um, are are experiencing, the kids at this elementary school I spoke at, the teacher and the principal said, they just come in Monday mornings angry. 
you know, they just walk in the door angry and I can't figure out why. And well, now they know why. And so then they can put some things in, in place there. And then um, so that's skill building with the parents because the weekend we don't have any control of, but maybe are there some things we can do to empower the parents um, that are interested? I mean, and that, you know, that's a big, big issue too. Not an easy, I'm not saying any of this is easy, but your kid comes to school every Monday angry. What's, what's going on? Right. Um, and, and the parents may be experiencing trauma and there's a lot of stigma around behavioral health and, and asking for help and, and going up to the, you know, the counseling center. I don't need counseling and my kid doesn't need counseling. But if that child is witnessing the things that, that are going on in this particular neighborhood, the parents are witnessing it. And so um, who, who's there for them and, and who talks to them about what's going on with them and some skills for them as well. In the back. I'm curious, what if your new integrative facility, what's the maximum number of kids that you, you'll be able to serve every year? That's an excellent question. <laughs> yeah, we, we, um, we, we struggle with capacity. We, we take all comers. I mean, it, it may be that there's a waiting. I mean, this is, out, this is an outpatient facility. So it's not no residential. Although when we first started building this facility, we thought about doing an overnight camp for kids who are obese. Um, but anyway, this is a, just like an outpatient facility where you're, you'll come. And so it really depends on staff. And so maybe the first opening for an assessment is three weeks, but the first opening to see the child psychiatrist is six weeks. So we actually don't turn anybody away as long as you're a Fulton County resident um, because our services are funded by the Fulton County taxpayers, but you might not be able to get into services. And that's the behavioral health services. Uh, these new services, we'll, we'll just have to see um, what happens. Last year, we saw about 750 kids um, in the clinic, so that was uh, 2011. When I started in 2006, we saw about 250 kids a year, so it's steadily increasing. Um, we started with one clinician, now we have three clinicians. Um, we have a, a collaborative system of care with staff that go out and work with families in their homes, so um, it, it's definitely growing, and I think we're you know, growing to meet the need as well. Um, so I'll tell you what I know about EMDR. So um, training at Emory, Dr. Barbara Roth Rothbaum was doing EMDR, and um, it was uh, the data. It supports EMDR as useful for trauma, and I haven't kept up with the literature, but I remember when I was training, and so that was, what, 92 to 97, and she was there. I actually think I observed a couple of sessions with her, um, and so as far as I know, um, it's, it's, it's still working. It's one of those things that um, everybody doesn't get to get because it's expensive, it's intensive. I'm not sure insurances are paying for it. Um, but as I recall, the last time I looked at the literature, it was, there was some evidence, uh, good evidence, peer-reviewed, double-blind, placebo control. You know, for us, that is the, uh, that is the panacea of, uh, of uh, evidence. Uh, what I know about that. She's still here. Is Dr. Rothbaum still in, at Emory? Does anybody, you, might, you guys might not know. She's still. Um, in residential treatment, they're using EMDR for, uh, again, victims of commercial child sexual exploitation. Um, I think insurance doesn't cover it, so I think it happens sort of as a collective in a, in a residential setting where they're not billing for each thing. Um, I've done it uh, on a personal note. I witnessed two bad car accidents, one where a semi went driving between two, uh, two semis. There was a motorcycle in the middle and he went out the other side. That was years and years ago. But then, I don't know, maybe five years ago, in Georgia on 285, I saw uh, an accident with a semi and a pickup truck and the men in the pickup truck were on fire and they had to get out and run. And luckily there was some water on the side of 285 so they were able to jump in. But so that was tra <laughs> dramatic for me. I don't like driving next to semis now. I don't really like driving on 285. Um, did EMDR, and it was really, really useful. Um, but my insurance didn't pay for it. I just have good friends who are also therapists. <laughs> are you talking about something that looks like voodoo? But it does work. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, the people I know who've had it have just felt that it was life-changing. And it's not, you know, like you said, I think it's not for everybody. You might explain it to someone and they're thinking, uh, no. <laughs> Could either one of you 
give that as sort of a general description for anyone who's not in the know about what those letters stand oh, for. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sure, go ahead. I, I am drawing a blank, um, but eye movement desensitization response or something we don't know that but yeah yeah eye movement desensitization desensitization response and um, it, it's basically a, a calming technique um, that's a, a short version of it but it helps when you uh, are, are being flooded by stimuli of a traumatic event they found and again I have looked at that that people who are traumatized have certain eye movements and they were able to look at that and I think she does something with her fingers and makes it sort of almost exaggerate it's almost like flooding in some ways which is um, flooding is a technique that I hope no one ever uses for me with my phobia of spiders or snakes but flooding is I like systematic desensitization that works better for me but if someone ever wanted I would not consent to this but uh, flooding would be um, for someone to put a bunch of snakes over there and force me to stay here. That's flooding, it does work, there's an evidence of that, but I like to see systematic desensitization where since for first I look at a snake in a book, and which I still can't do. <laughs> and, and then and then, video. and then slowly work my way up to it, but that, that will work for me. And I, I also don't know uh, what the evidence there is for younger children with uh, EMDR. It's a good question. But when you're, um, you know, this is my just one a take home message is to be skeptical. Um, there's a lot, especially in these days and times, there's a lot of information out there. And the first thing that comes up on a Google search is not the thing that's uh, the, in the peer reviewed uh, that is gone through the most scientific rigor. So I would be skeptical. I don't mind, and doctors and professionals who mind that you're skeptical of what they're doing, I would say, and this is a personal opinion, that you might want to find somebody else because um, I don't mind questions because if I have the data to support that, I should be able to explain it. But, um, and, and most doctors don't, as in, and doctors that I know. But just remember that the first thing that comes up on Google is not always the has the most evidence behind it. Any other last minute? No, any final questions? A few more minutes. Does anybody want to say anything about us uh, since I'm a child psychiatrist? I usually get the, um, and there's been a lot of um, discussion uh, and debate. Uh, maybe even controversy about psychotropic use in the foster care population. And clearly, it's too much um, when you look at the data. Um, let me say this. Clearly, it's high when you look at the data. And so then the next question is, is it appropriate? And we do know that uh, probably there is some times when it's not uh, appropriate. But we, so then we look at the systemic issues. And I know that um, sometimes it's because um, the person has, through no fault of their own, through no fault of the caseworker, through no fault of anybody, just the system, went to psychiatrist A and got a medication, and then went to another foster home, city, county, town, and went to psychiatrist B and got a medication. And then psychiatrist B didn't know that psychiatrist A had them, you know what I mean? And so that, that happens across across the spectrum, which is why I'm very excited about electronic medical records. Um, and as a psychiatrist, you can best believe HIPAA and patient privacy is important. But I think data is very important, and it's important for me to know what um, blood levels are so I don't have to stick you again um, You know, for the 10th time or do another x-ray or do another chest x-ray. Um, it's important for me to know all the medications you're on. It's important for me to know uh, all your other medical illnesses, your fam past family history. So we've got a lot of work to do with systems. But, um, you know, and so it's overprescribed in some and underprescribed in, in some. And really, we've got to get to appropriate use. And we've got to put systems in place so that there's appropriate use. Um, but I think, um, and you remember, I'm a conservative uh, person. So... Use is appropriate, but it should be used judiciously and also in combination with other forms of therapy as appropriate. I was going to say, just as you're speaking of um, with medication and foster care. I'm sorry, if you could speak a little louder. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, we, I know where um, the population that I work with, oftentimes we have 
we have children who come in with not only the series of medication, but also a series of diagnoses. And so you have like this whole listing of different things and there's, you know, you, you just know that at that point are not sure what you're treating. Um, but the question is, and then again, when you have the children in the foster care system, oftentimes we get them and they don't have, their records are inaccurate. Um, and they have, you know, certain records that may be accurate, certain records that's inner, inaccurate. It's just a whole listing of yes. different things. Um, and so trying to make, you know, adequate contact with different people, and it's just, ends up being a big, big mess. So we are also um, going across, putting everything, having it at medical records and have, trying to be more accurate about that kind of thing too. It's very, very helpful, so. I mean, I think that's the promise of technology with personalized health records that you take. Those aren't medical records, but those are your records that you take. Like, I'm taking my dad to the doctor on Thursday, and so I have all his medications, all of his surgeries. I have all that, so I can just go. Now, he's been to that doctor before, but the first time, here's all this information. So that's where the promise of technology uh, can help because if this if I hear a story today and it's this diagnosis, but I hear a different story this time, it's that diagnosis, and so that that will help. So those are systemic issues, not that there aren't individual practitioners who, um, you know, have issues, but systemic issues as well. We'll stick around a few minutes for questions. And I brought a copy of the book that I referenced earlier. It's got some great techniques in it if anyone wants to take a look at it. Thank and you. I have a good article too. And if you just write this down, it's um sorry for the long and should have put this up here, but um and it has a lot of information about the ACE study. Um, but you the CDC sponsored the ACE study, so you should be able to get some information on that. Um, responding to childhood trauma. The promise and practice of trauma-informed care. So that's responding to childhood trauma, the promise and practice of trauma-informed care, and the author is Gordon Hodas, O-H, I'm sorry, Gordon Hodas, H-O-D-A-S. So again, we thank the Barton Clinic for this opportunity and thank you all for coming today and look forward to, um, to working with you. I'm sure all of our paths will cross again as we uh, continue to tackle this significant uh, problem. I put business cards outside on the table with two articles that I also brought on trauma for everyone. So if you have questions or, or comments, feel free to email. Thank you. Thank you.